everyone. We are going to talk about one of my very favorite things, which is dermatology. I love talking about skin, skin-related issues, skin-related care. I'll try not to go overboard and stick to what I want you to know. So be patient with me. I get very excited about this because I need to get out more, clearly. All right, so getting started. First off, I just want to go over some learning objectives. So first off, we have understanding the pathogenesis of acne. Um, patho, pathology, means the study of disease, and genesis means creation. So how does this disease start? How does it progress? That's the first step. Um, we're going to go over some medications. We haven't gone over any drugs yet, so we're in pharmacology, and now we're going to start learning some specific medications. Um, I would always suggest making a drug table so that as we're going along, uh, just writing down uh, maybe a generic name, a trade name, the main mechanism of action, and anything special about that drug. Uh, in this chapter, you'll see that some, um, one in particular, is very, very dangerous in pregnancy. It's actually a category X drug, which we don't see a lot of. So that would be it's something special. So there's always going to be something, either a side effect or just something interesting about it. And that'll help you remember. That's what I would suggest. So then we'll go through the different types of acne and lesions and talk about some treatments. So I'd like you to think about making a treatment plan for somebody, what stage they might fall into, and understanding the behavioral interventions as well. Um, and as I mentioned, know the side effects of medication, especially the bad ones. We'll talk about uh, what we call contraindications. Contra is against, so that means against indications or against directions. Like some things you shouldn't do together, um, like a contraindication with being on benzoyl peroxide would be tanning. That's not ideal. But uh, you can't stop people from doing it. <laughs> you can just suggest that it's not recommended. All right, so we'll talk about that. And we'll talk a lot about the lesions because that will help you understand what level somebody is at and then how to treat them. I'm going to enlarge this little picture here for you that is a little gift. All right, so when we're talking about acne and lesions, just so you know, lesion is a pathologic term. It means whatever... Um, the kind of sign that you can see that's associated with that disease. Um, so the lesion is, in this case, we're looking at different types of skin lesions. So we've got a couple of things uh, that we're going to be paying attention to, and most of these lesions are going to be associated with the skin follicle or hair follicle, which is in the skin. So we've got a hair follicle, and then associated with that is a sebaceous gland, which makes sebum, or what we refer to as oil. And that's something that's nice. It decreases with age so that the skin becomes more dry, less supple, and more easily uh, wrinkled. So we want a good amount of oil, um, but we don't want too much, and we also don't want it to get clogged. And that's kind of how a lot of these lesions start, is just a clogged pore, be it with dead skin cells um, or keratin, like hair type of uh, proteins. And then once you have a clogging of a pore, that's when you start to get some inflammation because what you'll see is we now have a hotbed for bacteria. If this is covered, then that means that anaerobic or without oxygen uh, kind of thriving bacteria are going to be what can propagate there. Um, so if it's closed, we'll have bacteria underneath there and bacteria make gas so that will lead to some swelling some discomfort and also a local inflammatory reaction as the body tries to get rid of it if it is not covered if it's open and distended that's what's called a blackhead typically and oxidation is what turns things black so the reason we see this uh the sebum turning black is really an oxidation reaction it has to be in the line to have oxygen there. There is also associated infection. Um, we call purulent exudate pus, which means that it's 
not just fluid from inflammation, but it's also, uh, there's bacteria in it, which is going to color it. So that's a pustule, is a pocket of pus. If it's a very large sac of pus, that's called a cyst. Um, the difficulty with cysts are that they actually have a coating sac. And if that sac isn't removed, this will just keep filling up again and again and again. So you actually have to remove that, that coating sac, so cystic. Uh, there's papules, which are also going to involve um, a distended area, a ruptured follicle. This is when we start to see it getting a little bit more chronic and in, into the higher disease states when you see papules. And there's, it's called nodular um, acne or follicular nodular acne. Um, a nodule is a very deep rupture, and that's associated with really, really intense damage to the hair follicle and then subsequent scarring, which we'll see in a little bit. So making sure you have a general understanding of these lesions and what that means to the disease progression. So we'll start at the level of the skin. Uh, your skin is your largest organ. Um, it weighs a lot. Our skin's pretty big. And it's there to provide a barrier for your organs. Everything in our body is designed to work underwater and our skin and then the subsequent tissues underneath it help to provide that watery environment. Um, and it also helps keep fluid in. So for example, in cases of things like third degree burns, um, in a burn unit, you'll see that people have coverings or dressings over their open wounds and they're wet. And if they weren't, uh, you can actually see dehydration leading to hypovolemic shock, like low blood volume, because the water will dissipate into the atmosphere. So it's there to keep things in and keep things from going out. So it's big, it's covering all of us, and it can have a lot of weird things happen to it that we'll see. There's also a lot of uh, different sensory receptors embedded into the skin layers, and we'll take a look at some of those. There's temperature receptors, pain receptors, pressure receptors so that you know you're sitting on a chair or you're wearing pants. Uh, those are all stimulating pressure receptors. It helps regulate body temperature. Um, there's a great blood supply in your skin. And when we're really cold, like we live in, I live in Buffalo, we go to school in Buffalo. When you go outside, um, it's cold. So what your skin does is route the blood flow away from the skin and to the inner organs to keep you alive. And that's when you see something called blanching. So you get very pale because we cut off kind of like in a tourniquet fashion, the blood flow to the skin. Whereas if it's really hot, you turn red because that's one of the ways that we lose body heat by dilating blood vessels and allowing the heat to diffuse away. So that's called blushing. That also happens when you're embarrassed or you're scared or you're exercising. And there's also finally putting those both together, blanching and blushing. So if I went outside today, uh, there was actually a neighbor just dragging their kid on a sled and it was super cute, but I tried not to say anything about it. But now I did anyway. But if I were to go out there, jump on the sled with that little bro, I would get really cold. My skin would turn white because we have this tourniquet effect of uh, limiting blood flow and routing it to the core. Eventually, the areas in my skin that aren't getting blood flow will send out an ischemic message like, hey, we're not getting enough blood and oxygen. So we open up the tourniquets, we open up the floodgates to send blood there really quickly so that it doesn't die. So you're outside and first you blanch and turn pale and then eventually you see rosy cheeks and rosy noses. That's because those areas are now being filled with blood so that they're not ischemic. So that's called blanching slash blushing. And that happens again and again, as long as you're outside or somewhere that's chilly. So that's body temperature, excretion of fluid and electrolytes. Uh, as we said in the first few lectures, there's some things that we can excrete through the skin. Um, so we can get rid of water and through sweat and normal activities. We can excrete some substances like alcohol. And if you've ever licked your sweat or had it drip onto your mouth, you'll taste that it's salty. So sodium and chloride are very high um, in your sweat too that comes from your skin. 
It helps store some fat. Some have more than others, but that helps keep you warm. Um, vitamin D has a precursor in the skin um, that needs to be activated by going outside um, or having some access to sunlight. 15 minutes a day is recommended to the face and the hands without sunscreen so that you get full activation of this precursor of vitamin D so that it's activated into its final active form and it works. It helps you absorb calcium. And it's huge, so it's a great place to put drugs, which is what we're gonna talk about in this chapter. Not everything can go through the skin. Um, sometimes we'll need to add something else to the skin to allow things to penetrate, but um, it does give a good vehicle for a lot of different medications, and especially spot-specific medications. So if somebody is treating their acne, we usually start with a topical medication rather than going right to the pill route. Um, however, we can add those pills in, as we'll talk about. Okay, so what you're looking at here, just from an anatomy and physiology textbook, is a cross-section of the skin. And these capillaries I was talking about are in here uh, so that we have regulation of temperature. We have our outer uh, epidermal layers, which is separated by these basal cell layers where we would have some cell division. Um, then there's the dermis underneath the epidermis, and then underneath that is technically the hypodermis below the dermis, but it's subcutaneous fatty tissue. And as we were talking about subcutaneous injections, that's where you're, you're aiming for a sub-Q. All right, some other things that are fun in there. So we've got opening of sweat ducts, which are going to release the fluid, of watery, salty fluid out. There is a hair shaft, and inside of this hair shaft, this is the follicle. So this hair follicle, we're gonna spend a lot of time there uh, because that's where we're going to have the first part of the lecture talking about acne. In each hair shaft, there is an associated sebaceous gland, so that's making the sebum or oil. And that oil helps keep this hair nice and soft so that it can bend and it's healthy and it doesn't break off. If you ever have really dry hair, your hair breaks more easily. Hair on your skin acts as a sensory organ too. Um, there's actually sensory receptors around each hair. They're wrapped around. They're just called sensory you know, nerve endings associated with the hair. And they tell you if things are moving over your skin um, so that you respond to movement and pressure. So when you're putting on a shirt, for example, these would all be activated to tell you shirt is going on. And then as long as your shirt is on, they are feeling that pressure so that you know you're wearing it. If your shirt magically like flew off, uh, you would know right away because they would now sense that that is no longer there. Um, so hairy skin, that is one of the easiest ways to get pressure um, information because each hair has a sensory receptor associated with it. So when hair is shaved off, you're going to lose a lot of that sensory information, which is good or bad depending how you look at it in some cases. And this little oil gland is also going to provide oil to the epidermis to help keep that soft and supple and healthy, but it can get blocked. You can see that there's not much room in there. So if there is any blockage, then uh, that can propagate into inflammation really quickly. Other things, here's a cutaneous nerve, and that's collecting information from something called a Pacinian corpuscle. Um, that is something that helps detect also some pressure. Um, there's also, I don't know if it's in this picture, but one of my favorite things to say, it's called a Ruffini's ending, and it's really deep pressure. And I remember that because you have to have rough pressure <laughs> like that, Ruffinian. Um, so if you get a massage, the Ruffini's endings are only activated when it's really rough, deep pressure. There's also Meissner's corpuscle. That's another sensory receptor that helps sense things like vibration and pressure as well. So there's a lot going on here, and we're going to be focused mainly on this follicle. Again, we have um, some sensory information associated with it. You can also see that there is a muscle associated with it. It's called the erector pili muscle. 
when we are stressed, not just psychologically like I am all the time, but homeostatically stressed. So that is any time where your body is off of homeostasis, so cold, um, exercising, excited, things like that, um, something called piloerection happens in sympathetic outflow. And piloerection is when your hair stands up on end or you get goosebumps. This is a fun thing. It's actually an evolutionary well, remnant um, for predator stress and predator kind of um, fighting, essentially. So if somebody wanted to kill you or like a bear came and it was going to you know, eat you, your hair stands up on end. And that doesn't mean anything for us. The bear's not like, oh, no, she has goosebumps. I won't eat her anymore. However, if you were a wolf, for example, and your hair stood up on end, then you look bigger and you're more intimidating and it helps in that sympathetic outflow. So humans, we just get the leftover goosebumps. Animals can actually use that response. I guess you could too, but it doesn't help a ton for us. All right, so that's what the skin is. So what can we put on the skin? Well, there's a bunch of different formulations for medications. First off, we've got aerosol foams and sprays. These things you can imagine are very good for cases where you don't want to be touching the skin directly. So if it was athlete's foot, for example, maybe you don't want to put your fingers in cream and rub them all over an athlete's foot infected toe area. <laughs> so maybe you want to stay a little bit away from it. Maybe it's a sexually transmitted infection and there's a sore and we don't want to touch it directly because there's um, the germs on your hand, there's bacteria. So aerosol foams and sprays are a way to deliver medication, um, <clears throat> especially to areas that you don't want to be touching or areas that are really inflamed and become more damaged when they're touched. Just so you know, though, these are not as concentrated as other ways of getting something. So even if you think about suntan lotion, for example, you'll get more medication in a lotion and we know exactly where it's located and where it was put and what the dose is than you would in a foam or spray. So when you're thinking about ways to treat diseases of the skin, this is nice for, um, <clears throat> excuse me, not touching something directly and, but also not getting as much of that medication. Also know that foams and sprays are pretty drying. Again, that could be the desire. Maybe you want a foam or spray to dry out an area. But remember that, as I said, when you're young and you've got lots of oil in the skin, that helps keep the skin healthy and happy. When the skin becomes too dry, it's more likely to crack. And the more there's cracking, the better bacteria and viruses can enter. All right, then there's bars. So you'll see lots of bars with medication in them. It can be something as simple as like a Noxzema soap <coughs> or an antibacterial soap. So soap is just a detergent in a block or spherical shape, depending on which store you're at. Um, so a bar is a detergent with a medication in it. If you've ever used bar soap before, you will know that these are extremely drying. That could be the goal. Perhaps we want to dry out that area. For skin on the face, especially in acne, that would not be what would be recommended um, because that does lead the skin to become drier and more prone to damage. All right, so there's their bars. Then we have lotions. Lotion and creams go together sometimes, but if you've never learned the difference between them, I'm here to teach you. The difference between lotion and creams, A, is how they're sold and packaged. A lotion usually has a pump associated with it. Creams are difficult to pump out because they're thicker. Lotions have a higher percentage of water. So if you've ever used a lotion before, it spreads onto the skin, and then the water evaporates very easily. So it's easier to rub in. Whereas a cream is very low water. So you really have to work hard to rub it in um, because it doesn't really dehydrate that easily. 
This is important when you think about the skin type of someone, if we're talking just about acne right now. If someone is prone to very oily skin and their breakouts are associated with um, pooling of extra skin cells that don't slough away and we want to dry the skin, the lotion would be a better choice because it is more drying. Whereas a cream is something that is extremely moisturizing. It has almost no water in it, so it doesn't evaporate. It's thick and it is very, very moisturizing. Just as a formulation. Okay, ointments. So even preparation H, neosporin, those are all ointments. So they're oily, they're thick, and they are not <laughs> containing water like a lotion or a cream. They are oily, they are oil based. These are, depending upon the medium, um, either they're very, very oily and drying, or they're creamy, but they're still going to be drying. Um, so ointments are usually the most concentrated that you can get a drug. Um, remember, your skin is a cell, and our cells like fat-soluble things. Ointments are pretty fat-soluble, and if you put um, really emollient things in them, you can get a good diffusion of that drug right into the skin. So they're thick, um, and you can get a huge amount of medication in them. Powders are a great way to also deliver drugs. Powder, uh, they go everywhere if you've ever used powder before. Um, you can put a lot of drug in there, but you can't be sure how much will actually be um, absorbed. They're very drying. That's why they're used in diapers, for example, or to treat um, athlete's foot or jock itch. Uh, they are very drying. And they can be really helpful as first step interventions or what we call an adjuvant therapy. I'll write that out for you. Adjuvant, which kind of means additional. So it's a good adjuvant therapy for another condition. So let's say you're treating somebody with athlete's foot. What you really need is an antifungal, like an ointment that, that we would put on there. But the adjuvant might be an antifungal powder to put in the shoes or socks which not only will dry that area, which helps to starve the athlete's foot fungi, um, but it will deliver medication. So obviously, too, with that being said, thinking about lesions like athlete's foot, um, all things, as we discussed, when there's an open sore, will absorb more easily. So if there is an open lesion, it's going to have a direct access to the inner workings of the body. Okay, so we talked about creams. They're very, very thick. Um, they don't come with a pump usually. I have seen them with pumps and they're really difficult to get out because they're super thick. Um, you can put a huge amount of drug also in a cream. We'll see quite a bit of these throughout the lecture, um, but typically creams are more like moisturizing than an ointment would be. So you can choose which medium depending upon what's needed by the patient. Very drying are gels or jellies. Um, Vaseline is technically a jelly. Um, there's gel facial moisturizers. Those have the smallest amount of water when we're looking at creams, lotion, like ointments. Um, so very, very, they promote dryness. So they do a minimum amount of moisturization, but dry and promote dryness of the skin. Um, this also is a nice concentrated way to get drug um, onto the skin. Depending upon what is in there, we can't determine how much is going to get into the skin, but it is a good way to deliver medications and it is very drying. So you'll have to pick between like a gel, jelly, cream, like lotion, ointment, and thinking about how oily or what the outcome that is desired is. Do you want that area to be dry, long-term, short-term, and then make your decision. Oils are oils. If you, I'm sure you've seen oil before. Um, oils are very oily, as per their name. They, they promote oiliness. What we would say for putting typical oils on the skin, 
we'll talk about this term in a bit, comedogenic. So the lesions or pimples, the science name for them is comedome. So oils are comedogenic. They promote the creation of these lesions, of pimples, zits, uh, comedones. Um, when people put oil on their face, on their hair, if it's in cosmetics, it does clog pores. It's not meant to be kept on the skin. I know people like to use like coconut oil or things like that. If you read the full protocol, that has to come off of your skin eventually. So some people put coconut oil on and then you're supposed to take a bath afterwards or a shower because if you do keep oil on, it will clog pores. Um, you can get a super concentrated dose of a drug into an oil because it is a great medium. We even inject things in oil. Um, it's a great way to get it to dissolve. It is going to last a long time in the body, but just keep in mind, if you put it on the skin, it's going to be thick, it's going to promote oiliness, and it's going to promote the creation of lesions. Okay, finally, we have pastes. Pastes, if you've ever seen paste that kids use, like Elmer's paste, some people eat it. It's, I've never, I don't think that I did that. I probably would like it. Um, maybe I should try it. I don't even know if they sell it anymore. But something that's paste is very dry and really difficult to rub in. Thinking about the lesion, <laughs> do you want that person to be rubbing something in really hard to get it to absorb. Think about that. Think about how it's going to be delivered. Sometimes pastes, um, because they can contain so much medication, are recommended to be used along with gloves that are single use. Um, because there's almost no water in a paste, uh, it will be a really strong medium. There'll be very little dehydration. Um, and yeah, you'll see some really concentrated medications put into pastes. Uh, do keep in mind, though, that they're really difficult to rub in, and you might not want any more trauma to the area in that case. Okay, so even a toothpaste, that's a paste. In that case, you can rub on your teeth all day. That's what toothbrushes are made for. That's totally fine. But uh, you shouldn't put it on your face. Sometimes people will do that. We'll talk about why that's not a good idea in a little bit. Okay, so let's start out with acne vulgaris. So acne vulgaris is named because of the bacterium that is associated with it. So just keep this in mind, there's bacteria everywhere, it's super gross, anything you touch has a million different bacteria on it, which is fine because when that bacteria get into our body, our immune system can make copies of those things, and then we have memory cells that recognize them, and the more things we come into contact with, the more immune cells we have, um, and the better our ability to fight off those infections. But it's also pretty gross. So we have native bacteria, we've got good bacteria, um, and then there's more uh, looking for beneficial things to grow larger bacteria. So. There are ones uh, that are anaerobic, and then there's aerobic, so ones that thrive in high oxygen environments, and then there's ones that thrive in no oxygen environments. So if you think about um, like gangrene, for example, which is ischemia of a tissue, so now it's dyed, and it can become gangrenous. And if you think about dry gangrene, that is black tissue. So it's dead tissue, and now it's turned black. The reason it's black is because of the bacteria there. Once there's access of that dead skin, it's not getting any blood flow, so that means anaerobic bacteria can colonize it. Once it does that, that bacteria oxidizes, and then it appears black, and then you have to remove whatever has become gangrenous. So I want you to remember that we have anaerobic bacteria, and if you provide it, a nice medium to grow and thrive in an environment without, back, without oxygen, like a clogged pore, it will grow and thrive. And the way the bacteria works, just like we breathe and create CO2, that's what they do also. So when bacteria start to colonize, they make more copies of each other, they have a gross bacteria party, and they're all making gas. 
And so they're making this gas and acne, it's underneath the skin, a clogged uh, pore. So the more gas they make, the bigger uh, the pore is going to distend and the more painful it's going to be. So what you'll see in acne vulgaris, again, it's named for the bacteria that causes it. Um, there's going to be a couple of different things. There's going to be abnormalities in sebum or oil production. So that does coincide with life changes, most specifically uh, puberty related changes. We will see that hormones are highly involved in sebum uh, production. Both males and females have an androgen. Um, we'll talk about it later too, but it's made in the adrenal glands. It's called D-H-E-A-S dihydro like something it's a form of an androgen like a testosterone in polycystic ovarian syndrome for example that's a disease characterized by too much androgen so not only is there uh, changes to weight and to hair on the face and other regions of the body there's also acne associated with it because there's too much androgen or the form of testosterone that's circulating in the body in both males and females so the higher the androgen, uh, the more oil is going to be created, which is also why you see this spike in adolescence. The skin is growing, the pores are getting bigger, and at the same time, you have all this androgen being created to increase the sebum production. So it's a perfect storm. All right, the second thing is follicular desquamation, which is a fun, fun word to say, desquamation. That just means skin peeling. The very top of the epidermis is not associated with a lot of vasculature, so we don't have direct blood vessels going there if we take a look here. So here's the epidermis. The blood vessels are like down here in like these areas, but they're not going way up here. So when there's a lot of inflammation and swelling, the areas most distal or far away from the blood supply they'll start to die and then they peel off, which is normal in some cases, but in acne, there's a high amount of that happening where the skin is outgrowing its blood supply because of the lesions and then it becomes um, peeled off, it desquamates. Uh, proliferation means growth and spread. So bacterial proliferation, the entry of a bacteria into that pore, and then it makes its friends, it copies itself, there's a colony there, and they're all creating gas, which means that there's going to be swelling and then a resulting inflammatory response to the entry of a bacteria in the body. In the same way, um, somebody with a bladder infection, for example, feels like they have to urinate a lot. Well, that's because there's bacteria in there making gas. And when the bladder's full, there's a message to the brain, like it's time to go to the bathroom. But in bladder infections, sometimes people feel like they have to pee, but then they they can't, they can only express a little bit. They felt like that because their bladder was filled with gas from the bacteria. Gross, right? Totally, absolutely. So we have um, the bacteria making their gases and then the immune cells from the area, um, they're called to that region to fight off the pathogen. Whenever we have the start of an inflammatory response, we have the release of histamine from mast cells. And they're really helpful because what that is done for to accomplish is to make the blood vessels really, really leaky so that our white blood cells can get out and then kill the bacteria that cause the release of histamine. So they can't do anything inside of the bloodstream. They have to be able to leave and go address whatever the pathogen is. However, in making the blood vessels really leaky and dilated, they're going to get very red, um, Fluid's going to leave the vessel as well, so there'll be swelling, there'll be redness, and that is what we call inflammation, so linked with histamine. And that's a good thing. We want an inflammatory response to remove the pathogen. But it doesn't mean it feels good or necessarily looks good. All right, acne prevalence. 85% of adolescents experience it. So it's a very common disorder. It's actually one of the most common medical disorders in pediatrics because it's so common, everybody goes through puberty at some point. And when that does happen, um, we can expect that there'll be a breakout of a high amount of skin lesions. It is part of life, but that doesn't mean that it's easy. And for some individuals, 
um, it's much worse, as we'll see from the pictures. All right, so the presence of a lesion, so looking at every adolescent and asking scientifically, was there ever a lesion? Was there ever a comedone or a pimple? About 100% of people in their life have had at least one comedone. So it's very common, everyone's experienced it. And we know that in some individuals with the full on acne vulgaris, it can be really, um, in some cases, actually fatal when there's suicide secondary to the infection. All right, so about 8% of 25 to 34 year olds. So that would be um, adult acne when people are, I'm not gonna say like middle age, that's young. About 8% of young people, young adult um, acne. And then later on is adult acne, 35 to 44. There's only 3%. And that's just because of lowered androgen in all individuals as age goes up. So it's less likely at older ages, but it still does happen and it still is clinically relevant. So we should know how to treat it. So as we mentioned, it's the most common cutaneous disorder in the United States, 17 million Americans. One out of every 10 of patient encounters with a primary care physician is relative to some sort of comedone lesion. Um, again, uh, psychological morbidity and mortality due to suicide should let you know that this is an important thing in individuals' lives and understanding how to approach it and treat it is really important. So I want you to understand the disease pathogenesis and really what medications work best and what we might need to step up to in a treatment plan because it is a treatable disorder. That's important as well. All right, one other thing I want to mention, not only do we have these lesions, but there's also secondary hyperpigmentation. And hyperpigmentation is really just the melanocytes, so the melanin-producing cells, they become overactive when there's inflammation in an area. So even when a lesion goes away, there's still a resulting hyperpigmentation. And in some individuals, it's not as prevalent. Um, individuals with more melanin, uh, so typically, as in this picture, there's keloids also, which is just too much granulation tissue. It's too much scar tissue. Um, so hyperpigmentation. Melanocytes are overstimulated, and then they hyperpigment the disorder or the skin um, after inflammation. There is a name for it, like post-infection um, hyperpigmentation, which is actually a little bit misleading because it kind of gives the idea that it goes away. And as you might know, when there is scarring with hyperpigmentation, it doesn't necessarily go away. It can remain for a very long time. So hyperpigmentation is just concentration of damaged melanocytes causing darkening after inflammation. A keloid is a raised scar, um, which I'll show you some pictures of granulation tissue, but it's essentially what has to form in healing for the surface to uh, be built. So it's this pink tissue, you kind of see it on this individual over here. So it's really, really pink. And then what you would finally see over granulation tissue is the surface restoration. One fun fact about melanocytes is they don't um, do mitosis really well. So if you think about an area in your body that you had a scar or have a scar, you might notice that that line from the scar is still very pale. That's because the skin filled in, but the melanocytes didn't fill back in. That's my fun fact of the day. All right, so now we'll go through the pathogenesis. All right, so it is a disease of the pilosebaceous follicles. So pilo associated with the piloerector muscle, sebaceous is oil, and follicles are these holes here essentially. So here's the follicle, here's the hole, that's the follicle, and then we have these sebaceous glands. So glands contain tissue, so these are glandular cells making the oil, and then it would release that product into this duct here. And that should just be a lubricating type of oil called sebum. All right, but when you see the full pathogenesis of acne vulgaris, the sebum becomes blocked in some way. This could be, and 
is a lot of the time hyperkeratosis. Uh, hyper is excessive. Keratin is the protein associated with hair and nails. And osis means development of. So retention hyperkeratosis means that something is there. <laughs> it's being retained. It's not shedding off the way that we would expect it to. So now we have a plug duct. Then increased sebum production, which is associated with androgen. So we'll see this during adolescence. Also with females, that's something that changes throughout the menstrual cycle with um, the fluctuation of estrogen, progesterone, and then resulting androgen. That's why you'll see that birth control medications are indicated a lot of the time for acne vulgaris. So that's going to hold uh, the hormones steady so that there's not a cycling. All right, Propion <laughs> propionibacterium acnes, or P-acnes, was what I prefer to say, because I do not want to say that again, that was it, is the native bacteria, the anaerobic bacteria that will colonize a hair follicle and it thrives in anaerobic conditions. So once that plug is there, it starts to replicate, it starts to proliferate and then create gas and create a lot of inflammation so that we get this inflammatory response. So we have hair and skin and a plug holding all this extra oil in there. Then we have bacteria thriving and growing with inside that follicle. So that's really where we start. When we get to about the age of eight, that's normal development for sebaceous gland activity. So the sebaceous glands start to get bigger and prepare for more adult skin. And that's also going to be the time when we start increasing a little bit of sebum production. So starting at the onset of like menses and females, which the average age right now is about 10, so this is pretty young. And in males, we see like 12 to 14 um, is when these things start to kick up as well. So once there is sebum, that is a great growth medium for the P. acnes bacteria because it loves oil and it loves anaerobic environments. When there is a plug to the hair follicle, that gives it like a vacation home. It never wants to leave because it has everything it's ever wanted right there. It's got an anaerobic environment and a nice, oily, lipid-rich environment to thrive in. So it thrives, and then there's inflammation. And then you've got your immune cells, like neutrophils, coming to try to remove this P. acnes bacterium. The histamine was released to allow them to get to that area. I love this word, chemotactic. Chemo means chemical, and tactic comes from taxi. So chemotaxis is the act of moving to the spot a chemical is leading you. So it's kind of like uh, if you think about the breadcrumbs and the gingerbread house, you know, followed the trail of breadcrumbs. Hansel and Gretel, yes, those people. They follow the breadcrumbs to get to the gingerbread house. That's like what immune cells do. They just follow the signals from whatever is attracting them. So that's what chemotaxis is. So they're going to that site depending upon what's being released. And then we have the resulting lesions. So they're either going to be uh, classified as inflammatory or non-inflammatory. And if we think about inflammation, it's characterized by redness, swelling, heat, pain, and loss of function. So you're going to see redness, swelling, inflammation, okay? So in inflammatory acne, there's going to have to be some redness and swelling just by looking at it, you can tell. Non-inflammatory would be an absence of redness, swelling, and then we're going to get into open close lesions. All right. Are you with me? Very good. Let's go. So let's talk about acne. We're going to look at lots of pictures of it. So on the left, we have comedonal, so non-inflammatory. And on the right, we have inflammatory. So I want you to be able to make that distinction right away. So the lesions themselves are, if you've ever had a pimple or seen a pimple, they are going to be red. They're supposed to be. However, they're small right? Your hair follicle is tiny. So it's normal to have redness of just that lesion. When you have surrounding inflammation and then resulting like cysts associated with that, that is more inflammatory or cystic acne. And remember a cyst 
or a nodule is going to result from the bursting of a follicle and then the rupture of the contents into the surrounding area, which will increase the swelling and inflammation. Okay, so we're going to look at a lot of these lesions and we're going to call them comedone, comedones for plural or just lesions, which will be open or closed. And they always begin with what's called a microcomedone, which is just the beginning of a hyperkeratotic plug made of sebum and keratin in the follicular canal. One fun fact about them, and you'll see this written down later on, it takes like seven weeks for microcomedone to mature into a full on comedone. So sometimes you'll see these products like a spot treatment, like feel a pimple coming on, like press this magic wand like thing on your skin and watch what happens. Uh, or put some toothpaste on it and see what happens. Spoiler alert, your face will smell like toothpaste and now you have an even more blocked duct. Um, one thing that people really like to do, which you shouldn't do, is peroxide. So what peroxide does is introduce oxygen into places and then it kills the anaerobic bacteria because there's oxygen there now. That's why it bubbles when you put it on. So if you put like peroxide on this comedone, you'd see it bubbly and it get down in here. But why I say don't do that is peroxide doesn't discriminate between like bad bacteria and like good skin cells. So you do get extensive damage to healthy cells as well from the peroxidase activity. But it does introduce oxygen into places and make it all fizzy. But what I want you to know is that these things just happen. You have a plug and it takes about seven weeks for it to mature and then it becomes um, measurable at the level of the surface. So the lesions that we'll look at, we have the open comedo or what we call the black heads, which is essentially just a distended open pore that allow the lipid rich bacterium now to oxidize. So that will turn the filling, the sebum, black. Closed comedone is when there, the plug is retained and it's underneath the very uh, tip of the epidermis so that we don't have an open distended pore. There's a closed pore and then the sebum underneath it. Then there's inflammatory lesions and I want you to notice the big difference between here's non-inflammatory and here's inflammatory. Lots of redness and swelling. And then we also see the skin shedding off like the follicular desquamation. So here's an inflammatory papule, and we'll see the difference between a pustule, which would be filled with pus. Magic. Ready for pictures? I hope so. Okay, so this is your drawing so that we can relate back to our different lesions. So here's an open comedone with oxidized contents. If it's closed, we just have a plug. We have a plug sebaceous gland, increasing oil production, leading to this plug and resulting redness and swelling. Fun facts. So people do pop pimples. We'll talk about how that is not great. A, because you have lots of gross things on your hands, as we already mentioned. This is a lesion, so this is open. You're touching it with your fingers, which are full of bacteria. Now that bacteria is in here too, and you have a superimposed infection. That also creates a lot of trauma to the skin. So we already have inflammation. The more trauma you give, the more post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation there will be. So there'll be more discoloration and it will last quite a long time. You should never stick a needle in here, ever, ever, not only would I doubt uh, that your needle is as clean as you would want it to be to stick surgically into a face or a lesion, that creates quite a bit of damage. And it's not going to cause the reaction that you probably want. Um, there's lots of great pimple popping videos online if you ever want to go down that rabbit hole, but they use some non-invasive types of um, non-traumatic tools to scoop out the contents of these things. You're not going to see needles in faces, hopefully. If you do see those types of videos, look away. Don't do that. There is a correct way to pop a pimple. This will be my real life fact of the day. Instead of the fingers pushing towards each other, the fingers are supposed to be pulled away. 
So if one finger was placed on either side of the lesion and then almost like you were opening up that pore, that's a less traumatic way to do a pimple popping, but still you're encouraged not to do those things because of the increased trauma. And ideally, there would be a hot compress on top of that first to loosen up what's in here and make the skin more pliable. But we would say to reduce the amount of trauma to the skin to reduce the chances of scarring and hyperpigmentation. Okay, so just going through the lesions again, uh, which is important because you do have to know what is present for the different types of acne. So we've got closed comedones or whiteheads. Those are non-inflammatory. It's just a closed plug. The more sebum there is, uh, this is a microcomedone maturing into a closed comedone. So again, you see the lesion itself has some redness and swelling, but it's just the size of that follicle, not extremely inflammatory, and it's really just a closed oil plug with bacteria underneath it making some gas, causing that swelling. Here's some more pictures of closed comedos, again, non-inflammatory, just red lipid plugs, looking great. So those are closed comedones, non-inflammatory, as opposed to an open comedo or a blackhead. So that's the same thing, sebum plus P. acnes, but not having the cover allows the contents to be oxidized, which will change the uh, color of the contents. All right, so melanin and packed keratinocytes, so the things that made up that plug, and then you have oxidized lipids, so there's this nice dark color. It's still the same contents, it's just a distended orifice and oxidation of contents. So that's that, some more open comedos. So this is around an eye, and this is around the lip, which is a very common place for people to get them. And you can imagine why, I'll let you guess. <laughs> Did you pick because there's stuff on your lips, perhaps? And most of the time, people are putting oily stuff on their lips, right? So we said Vaseline is very oily. It's, a, it's an ointment. Chapstick, all those things, those physically block pores. So if that's not applied just directly down here, that does allow um, comedone creation. And similarly, around the eye, you could see this from, uh, not only is this a hard place to get to, like to clean, it's pretty tough to get to actually, but um, this is where cosmetics are worn. We recommend that people check the labels of their cosmetics, and if things have oil in them, they should avoid them. Because remember, oil-based things are comedogenic. Another fun fact is we have a lot of oil in our hair, right? It's normal. We talked about that. We've got sebum being created all the time in every hair follicle to keep our hair shiny and beautiful and pretty. So naturally, there's a lot of oil being created at the scalp to keep your hair from looking like a bird's nest, like mine does right now. So when people are messing with their face or putting on cosmetics, you might not even think about this, but if makeup is done before the hair, that's what's best for the skin. So not only could you have oil-based cosmetics causing this type of skin plug formation, but putting on cosmetics after you do your hair, you're now transferring all the oil from your hair to your fingers and then putting that all over the face. So. Keep that in mind, the order in which you do things is actually really important. Go figure. We're learning so many fun things. Okay, and then I'll use the term cystic acne. Um, it's called sometimes like nodular cystic acne. Cystic is typically referring to inflammatory types of acne. So a cyst is when you have the rupture of contents and there's an associated sac. A cyst is a sac filled with fluid, usually just clear um, exudate, the fluid form via inflammation. A cyst filled with pus is called an abscess. If an abscess heals and you don't take out the sac, 
if the infection goes away, it's going to be a cyst. It'll, instead of being a pus-filled sac, it'll be a fluid-filled sac. So as long as those um, sacs remain in the body, the cyst will remain. So people will burst them or try to take methods into their own hands. Without the removal of the encapsulation, the cyst will just keep filling it up. So cysts occur when the follicles have ruptured into the tissues, and then you see these inflammatory lesions uh, that we call papules, pustules, or then the full-on like nodules, so a nodular cyst. So this is what a cyst looks like in different parts of the face. So we can see that here in all of these pictures, we have the rupture of the follicle, and we see the contents now have spread from just the hair follicle. So there's a lot of peeling, there's a lot of redness, and there's a lot of swelling. Here's some more cystic acne. And in cases where there's full cysts with a, with a cap, with this sac, the sac does have to be removed. Dermatologists can do that. They are trained to do that. And uh, this is the worst progression is cystic acne. Um, so this one is treated a little bit differently and we'll get into that in just a second. So those were cysts and now we'll just go to the other inflammatory lesions. We've got papules. So again, inflammatory, it's redness and swelling, follicular desquamation. So papules are mainly just our oil plug, redness, and the sebum underneath. So that's a papule, red raised bumps beneath the skin, which is different than a pustule where the sebum, this pustule here, that is not beneath the skin, it's at the surface of the skin. So papules, sebum's underneath, it's just red and raised. Pustule, the pus is what's prominent here. Not underneath the skin, on the skin. All right, and as I said, it's really important to minimize any kind of trauma to the skin. When there is, when there's cystic lesions, um, even when they heal, so this is decades later, you do see some lesioning here and permanent scarring. Um, you can still see remnants of cysts and things of that nature. Once uh, we get to this level of scarring, there are a couple of different procedures that are possible. So there are different laser treatments, there's different chemical peels. Um, those have a varying degree of success. Uh, so ideally, what I want you to take away from the lecture is if we can prevent the disorder from getting this progressed, then we can prevent the resulting inflammation, but the scarring and the hyperpigmentation. So those things do remain for quite a bit of time. Okay, so what are some things we have associated with this? So we know that you need to have oil and you need to have hair in your follicle. So we all have that. So what are some other things that are associated with this? Um, as I mentioned, any oils or greasy things or dyes in hair products or in cosmetics, those are comedogenic. So checking the labels of um, different cosmetics, of anything that's put on the body, on the face, making sure it's not oil-based, um, and checking out whether or not it's rated by the American Associ or Association of Dermatology. So you will see that things are actually recommended. So those are thought to be safer and non-comedogenic. So checking out cosmetics, doing hair after the face, um, using things that are water-based, those can help prevent um, some breakouts. All right, repetitive trauma. So this girl is doing a squeeze in the wrong way. This, just pushing the skin together is going to cause a lot of trauma, minor levels of bruising, but possible resulting hyper or, um, pigmentation. So minimizing the trauma, letting it heal, and again, anytime you would you feel that you absolutely need to, putting a warm compress on there, and moving the fingers instead of pushing them together, pulling them away from one another. But the more you're touching your face, the more likely it is that this will get worse eventually. All right, so washing your face, washing your body, <laughs> patients washing themselves, anybody washing themselves, think about what the medium is, right? 
if it's a bar soap that will promote a lot of dryness. Even though it feels like that's the right thing to do, remember that the drier the skin is, the more likely it is to become damaged due to cracks. The more cracks there are, the better uh, the ability of bacteria to enter the bloodstream or to the body. So try not to just dry everything out. What we have on our skin, we have this nice protective oil barrier. We also have a microbiome there that helps kill things when they get in. So we don't want to strip that all away. So we want to minimize trauma, not just with um, squeezing pimples, but using really harsh uh, scrubbers or peels. We don't want to strip off the body's natural defense, which is our nice outer layer of oils and microbiome. So ideally, washing with a soap, um, a gentle soap, only when it's necessary. So for example, in like I'm a, I wear makeup, so at the end of the day, that's a good time to wash the face. I want to get the makeup off, I want to get all the junk off my face, and go to bed with a nice, clean pillow. One other fun fact is it's been shown that silk pillowcases decrease the amount of transference of bacteria to the face, and they don't cause as much kind of smothering of the face so that uh, you don't create plugs yourself when you're sleeping, like on your stomach or your side. Is that fun? Yeah, silk, actual silk, not like fake silk. You have to get the real stuff, but it works. All right, so what I was saying is, all right, I wash my face at night, got my stuff on, feeling good. Do I want to wake up and wash my face again the next day? In the morning, after I already wash my face at night? The answer is no, because all I did was sleep. And I'm not dirty. I wasn't sweating. I wasn't doing anything except sleeping. So not washing constantly. The more the face and the body is washed and the harsher the detergent, the more you're going to strip off the protective coating. Not using really harsh things on the face either. So I've already mentioned like peroxides. Um, actual scrubs, I know they sell those little Clarisonic brushes and stuff, those are, those are traumatic. They cause more damage. Do not strip off the outer layers of the face. Using really strong astringents, something with alcohol, that kills everything good on your face. Don't do that. When you use anything alcohol related on the face, you actually strip away and kill the microbiome that was there. Now you have an area that's not protected. So we don't want to do that. If people are using um, like a mechanical exfoliator, like a scrub or like a face scrub, things like that, no more than twice a week should that be done. More than that, you're going to fully scrape away everything good on the face. So mild soaps, look for ones that are dermatologist recommended, only washing when it's dirty, like uh, after the end of the day or after a workout. Otherwise, just splashing the face with some cold water and then putting on something, you know, safe, like a little sun protection or moisturizer that is not oil-based. All right, I want to, oh, one other thing to say. Oh, oh, I get so excited. All right, so I mentioned don't put toothpaste on a lesion. One thing, because we know that this is inflammatory, uh, that drives the redness and inflammation is um, using an aspirin. So instead of putting something like toothpaste or peroxide, taking an aspirin, if it's safe, if it's recommended that somebody could take aspirin, grinding it up a little bit into a paste and then applying that directly to the lesion, um, that would be a way to uh, spot treat a bad lesion. Okay. We also know more humidity, uh, so like in the summer when it's uh, muggy, that makes uh, it more likely that you create a plug. Also, the tighter your clothes are, the longer you wear your clothes, uh, the more constrictive your clothes are. So really tight pants, tight shirts, workout shirts. Those things are meant to be taken off eventually. Uh, the tighter they are, the less, I mean, literally, things can't breathe. And remember that everything in this P. acne's world loves to be in an anaerobic environment. And also just more perspiration. So that's kind of where the, the powders come in. So by keeping the areas drier, using a powder, um, that decreases the amount of perspiration that will accumulate. 
and then form a plug when a crust is created. If you've ever been like really sweaty and then it's like salt, right? So that can create a physical plug. All right, so there's some things that we could do and things that we can let patients know to see if it will get better. We don't know a ton about diet. You probably heard as a kid that greasy food or chocolate was associated with acne development. Um, almost 50,000 women, they looked at milk, um, whether or not they're drinking big glasses of milk. And they did find the more people drank, the more likely it was that they had acne. Um, that could be because this is, again, it's hormonally based and those, I mean, cows are obviously lactating, so they had to have been pregnant to do that. So that is expressed in the milk um, and shared with whoever's drinking it. And some correlation has been found with stress. That's a really tiny study and I don't, you know, whatever. I can imagine that that is true because you are immunosuppressed when you're stressed. Um, but sometimes just if you think about how you're sitting when you're stressed, putting your hands on your face, touching things, putting your hands back on your face, uh, that is something that also is associated with lesion development, touching and clothes. Okay, so here's your different classifications. So type one through four, and we're going to start at the less severe is type one. So just mainly comedone, comedonal acne, so it's not inflammatory maybe an occasional inflamed papular pustule, but not prevalent normally in that individual. There's no scarring, so just comedonal non-inflammatory. Type two, comedones and more uh, numerous papules and pustules on the face with some mild scarring or hyperpigmentation, that's type two. Type three, lots of comedones, papules, pustules, and then it becomes uh, less specific to the face and more to the other places on the trunk, um, like back, chest, shoulders. You can see cysts or nodules and moderate scarring with type 3. And type 4 is the most severe, uh, large cysts on the face, neck, upper trunk. You will see that different places have um, different categorizations, uh, so it's not like a strict gold standard where type 2 is the same everywhere. But understanding that once uh, it becomes inflammatory and then cystic, then it becomes a more um, severe and difficult to treat typology. And that will change the treatment. So basic or basic, basically, the treatment is going to depend on the type of lesion. And it's also going to depend on what type of skin they have. If it's oily, if it's dry, and also taking the timeline into account when you start a treatment it's not going to get better immediately for that person because they still have the microcomedomes that haven't come in yet to mature so it takes seven to eight weeks so that means the treatment is going to have to extend at least beyond eight weeks to get everything that's coming up the docket so what type do they have and how uh, suited are they? Sorry, I couldn't find my words for that specific treatment. So then let's go over these medications really quickly, and then I'll make a separate lecture for the rest after acne. But I'm going to start out with the most common medication, and it's always uh, pretty much the first line of therapy, and it's benzoyl peroxide. And benzoyl peroxide is what is sold as proactive, for example, uh, which is on the next slide with Jessica Simpson back in the day in her heyday on that slide. But benzoyl peroxide is a concentrated way to harness the power of peroxide, which again introduces oxygen into places without oxygen, which is why you see it making things all bubbly. So benzoyl peroxide is something that uh, you can put on the face it will get all, there's a homeless cat outside. I'm going to make it come in and love me. Oh man, I can't, it's so cute and it's snowing. I probably, okay, let me finish this lecture and then I'm going to go kidnap that cat and love it. Okay, so it's going to slowly release oxygen. Um, it's going to loosen the scales so that we can allow the keratin to loosen and the follicles to open and breathe. 
and it works really well. It's cheap, it's got great outcomes, it is easy to use, you wash your face with it, and you can get it in a cream or a gel. And if this doesn't work, you can move on to the other treatments, but this has really, really great outcomes. Um, because it is strong, it can uh, ha cause some skin peeling, some redness, the skin's gonna feel a little warm. Um, over time, it will get better, we'll see that. But good prognosis means good outlook. Another fun fact, just for real life too, um, anytime you have a prescription for something, you're gonna get more drug. If you get something over the counter, it's not gonna be as strong. So the difference with like a proactive versus something for, uh, or from the dermatologist or from the physician or from a nurse practitioner, whoever is writing the prescription, it's going to be a higher dose. So that's gonna be the good stuff. You're always gonna get a better outcome with a prescription of the ingredient. So proactive is the over-the-counter uh, benzoyl peroxide, and that works too, it's just not as concentrated. You will have a higher concentrated dose in a prescriptive dose. Here's your rule of twos for benzoyl peroxide. So this individual, her skin is really clear, but it is red, and that's because it does cause some redness and swelling. It's going to burn off a little bit of skin too, and we're going to essentially kill the initial layer of lesion skin over time and then the new skin will come back underneath and new tissue is always pink granulation tissue is like that so in two days it's going to burn two days it's going to be red in two weeks it's going to get worse but things always get worse before they get better so in two months it will improve and after two years try to reduce people can be on this forever because it works really really well and if benzoyl peroxide is not giving you the immediate um, relief that you would expect then you can move on to the other types of medications, but this is number one treatment, topical, wash, cream, gel, as needed by the patient, works great, great prognosis for all types of acne. We can always start here with benzoyl peroxide. All right, then there's the uh, vitamin A type drugs, retinol or retinoids. Uh, retinoids are used for all types of things, and what they do is, <laughs> when you put them on topically, the, uh, the easiest way to say it is they're going to, well, they say increase cell turnover, which means it's gonna like burn and kill your top layer of skin and signal to the cells that divide that you're gonna need to make some new skin cells so it hopefully didn't look the way your other ones did. So they use it with aging, with wrinkles, with scars, with hyperpigmentation, because it's pretty strong. It does make you pretty photosensitive. So they recommend that people only use their like retinol acids at night. Um, even if you use them at night, you should use sunscreen the next day. Um, that is because it makes you really sun or photosensitive and it's more likely that the skin will become damaged because already there's mild inflammation from it. Again, that mild inflammation, what we're doing is taking advantage of the fact that you're going to kill the skin and then new skin will grow back essentially. It is pretty irritating, so you start in the lowest strength with these retinol creams and you can progress if needed, but just know that the higher you go in dose, the uh, more damaging uh, it's going to be over time. Um, like benzoyl peroxide, like it gets worse after two weeks. There's typically a pustular flare in the first few weeks, and that flare means it's going to get better soon. So like everything else, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay, other things. Azalic acid is an ingredient in other medications, which does a lot of cool things. It breaks up comedones, it's anti-inflammatory, it causes skin lightening, so you'll see it used in different oils and concentrates and serums for hyperpigmentation, for age spots, for darkening, and it's antimicrobial, which means it kills microbes and bacteria, which is great because in acne, we've got this P. acnes bacteria we wanna get rid of. And we also know that there's resulting hyperpigmentation. So this is skin lightening, um, so it can help kind of prevent that over time. It, it does cause some burning, stinging, puritis means itching, 
tingling. So basically things are going to burn on your face. It can be used as a cream or a gel depending if you want the skin moist or the skin dry. This is used for mild to moderate and it's usually just for those who can't tolerate benzoyl peroxide because benzoyl, or benzoyl peroxide works really, really well. And it's sold under a bunch of different names now. Um, but again, I really want you to know the generic names of things so that you can spot ingredients regardless of where you see them. Because you'll see this in over-the-counter meds too, Azalic. Okay, and then finally, um, just topical wise, we've got salicylic acid. And salicylic acid is, um, you might recognize that name, that's the generic name for aspirin, salicylic acid. And salicylic acid is sold all over the place. It's contained in really every um, like acne medication you'd find at a drugstore. And by itself, it doesn't do a ton besides dry out that area, which makes your face feel really squeaky clean. So it sells really well, but it doesn't really penetrate the skin um, on its own. However, what that means is you can take advantage of the fact that it makes things really squeaky clean um, by increasing the penetration of other substances by using this first. So you'll see this used, like if you saw that proactive regimen on there, there is um, like an astringent that's used. So if you put an astringent or a wash with salicylic acid in and then apply the benzoyl peroxide in that medium, the benzoyl peroxide will have a better penetrating power. So it's going to work better. So we call that a synergistic effect. They get together and they work even better. So salicylic acid is sold, I mean, literally in everything. You can get it in a cream, in a gel, in a soap, uh, in a lotion, in pads with astringent on them. There's shampoo for it for individuals who tend to get lesions on their scalp. Uh, body acne, there's body washes for it. There's a soap bar with it. So it works really great, and I would recommend that when you're giving somebody a treatment plan that you include salicylic acid and its ability to allow deeper penetration in that in some capacity because it does have really great outcomes and it's super cheap. As I mentioned, when you get this over the counter, there will be low levels of the drug, so you'll see it in like clearasil at 0.5% or maybe 2%. When you get it from um, somewhere that's prescribed, it can go up to 13%. You're always going to get a higher dose when it's prescribed. If that person has insurance, you can get this for really cheap too. Cheaper than what you would see on the shelves. So if you can do that, that would be great. So that's salicylic acid. All right, now fun stuff. All right, I'm almost done. Almost done. All right, isotrenitoin is um, Accutane. Accutane is one of the very few category X drugs in pregnancy there are on the market. What a category X means is we know based on studies in humans, in animals, that not only is it going to be dangerous to the fetus, but it does cause direct fetal harm. It can cause the loss of the pregnancy early um, birth or miscarriage, death after birth very quickly, physical birth defects. It says on here two negative pregnancy tests. I think they actually pushed that to three just recently. So if a female wants to use that, it's fine if she's not pregnant. It's not going to cause fetal harm if there's no fetus. So it's required that the female provide evidence in the office with three pregnancy tests over time that they're not pregnant uh, before getting a prescription for this, because it does cause fetal harm, miscarriage, and we do not want to do that, especially as medical providers. It is our duty to know that that uh, is a big problem. We don't want to give Category X drugs out to individuals who could be childbearing. So this could be oral or topical. It doesn't matter which one it is. <laughs> we don't give it to pregnant ladies. It's made by Roche Pharmaceuticals, and this is the only medication. So all the other ones, they're treating the lesions. We're introducing um, oxygen into the pores. We're cleaning the face. This is the only one that's actually going to change the progression of the disease itself. It physically is going to reduce the size of the sebaceous glands. 
it's actually going to reduce sebum production. That's really cool. And it regulates cell proliferation. It lasts a year after you stop taking it. It's the only one that actually targets the disease etiology itself. Etiology means cause, sorry. Um, all the other ones are just targeting, you know, what your face is doing. So it works really great, but keep this in mind. It is dangerous to a fetus. You never give it to a pregnant individual. Just to give you an idea of pregnancy categories, I've included them here on slide 36. So you can take a look at those. Um, category A is like everything is A-OK. -okay. It's not going to do anything in, you know, most other species and humans and that's well established um, so yeah your category x that's it's very never x is for never never give to a pregnant person all right and then finally uh, we've got trinitoin cream so we went through isotrinitoin this is an acid form of vitamin a uh, this is used again for aging for skin spots sun damage stimulates the turnover of epithelial cells because it does kill um, the epidermis that you put it on. It does cause skin peeling because of that. It can be given in a cream or gel, and it, it, this is pretty strong, it may result in severe irritation and skin peeling. Um, this is another thing you would recommend using at night, using a sunscreen for, and this can be added to another regimen um, but when you think about first steps, I want you to think about um, benzoyl peroxide, adding in salicylic acid, adding a vitamin A drug if necessary, and in really severe cases of inflammatory, cystic, nodular acne, that's when um, you're going to see using the oral medications. Okay. So what do you have on the next couple of slides are different treatment plans for mild, moderate. So I want you to take a look at those because when we meet, I'm going to have you uh, talk to me about your treatment plans. So like what you would do in the case of mild acne, moderate acne. And I'd also like you to take a look at why certain um, antibiotics are used, which ones you would recommend, and why we might want to add a hormonal birth control in there. So we'll talk about that next time. I am just including in a couple little things for you too that uh, you can take a look at. There's two newer therapies um, that have gone through some clinical testing. There's blue light therapy. The FDA has approved this. It is very expensive. Um, in this picture, the way that they give it, it's essentially just giving pulse blue light to a patient. It takes about eight treatments and it costs like $800 to $1,600. However, there is a, a, an individual unit that just came out recently that has some pretty good data associated with it. So it's kind of like a little pocket blue light. And uh, yeah, it's got some really great information um, and its prognosis seems to be similar to blue light, or sorry, to benzoyl peroxide. So it, it's interesting and um, yeah, so check that out. And that's a little bit different than laser therapy, which is just a pulsed laser um, set to a certain wavelength. So it's not blue light, it's just laser. And when they've done studies on this, they actually have differential effects. So some studies show that it worked really well, it works best after three months of treatments, um, but in other trials it's shown like no benefit at all. So what we do know is that the benzoyl peroxide works really well, it's not going to cost what a blue light therapy would. Just to give you an idea of the cost for these things, so if we were using a specific like 100 meg of um, an antibiotic, we're talking like 22 bucks, um, 160 without insurance, benzoyl peroxide 5%, it's 22 bucks, it's really cheap. Erythromycin gel, so a topical antibiotic, 60 megs, we're talking like 37, maybe $60. So this can be treated really uh, cheaply and easily. Again, uh, 
thinking about how we would approach a treatment paradigm for mild, moderate, severe acne, what lifestyle recommendations we would recommend, and, um, and why. That's what I would like to talk to you about. Other things that I mentioned a little bit, so to kind of take away, soaps, detergents, and anything that you wash your face, your body with, they do take away the oil, but they don't change the amount of oil that you produce. The only thing that does is your Accutane, that oral isotretinoin. Everything else is just cleaning off. So consider what you want to do. I've already mentioned occlusive clothing. If you're sweating in your clothes and they're tight, you gotta take them off. I love yoga pants too, but some of them are not gonna breathe. Some shirts aren't going to breathe. We know that silks, things like that, they hold the less amount of, or least amount of oil. Um, they do the least amount of transfer. Those work really well at preventing plugs from forming, but sweating in something, take it off. <laughs> That's good. Take it off eventually, change into something else. Cotton breathes really well. Use water-based, no oil-based, and don't worry about cutting out the chocolate or the french fries. Greasy foods are um, indicated because you probably touch your face with the grease on it afterwards. Actually ingesting any of those things doesn't have really any activity um, on whether or not there's sebum that's produced. Oof, all right, I'm getting worn out from talking so much and now I'm gonna go chase that cat down and make it love me. I saw it cross the street, so this might have to be a little bit more of a jaunt than I initially signed up for. <laughs> I'll see you guys later.